interesting. All right, well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, let's see. So you know the drill. Uh, pen the thumbnail if you want to see me. Uh, scream at me if you can't hear me or whatever. Uh, internet issues or my mic is off, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's good to see you all. Welcome back. So the plan for today is as follows. Um, we have a few leftovers from, um, <clears throat> from Tuesday, excuse me. Uh, we didn't get to cover something that I thought was important. So I just want to sort of rehash that. Then we're going to talk about lit reviews. And I suspect um, we might even finish early, but you know, famous last words. So let's see. So um, let's start with this. We talked about theory uh, on uh, Tuesday. And um, we talked about essentially how um, you got to have a theory, and I was trying to convince you of this. We talked about kind of you know, what a theory is and what a theory isn't, and how people think about theory uh, when they um, assume maybe a positivist worldview versus a constructivist worldview. We talked about some of the distinctions there. Uh, and I even gave you an example of how theory borrowed from a completely different field, uh, from a different domain, might be informative when you're looking at uh, some sort of software engineering or collaborative uh, things uh, in the open source world. Um, so we talked about all of those. Um, but the thing that I started with, if you remember uh, class on Tuesday, was this example of, of Stu that had built a tool and had um, uh, designed an evaluation study and sort of had, uh, had, had done that evaluation study. Um, and um, we talked about sort of how uh, some of Stu's uh, findings from the evaluation study uh, were maybe a little bit surprising. Um, how, to, for example, there was no, uh, uh, Stu was unable to confirm any of the hypotheses that he, he had set off with. Uh, there was no support for, for any of those. Um, people's uh, programs weren't any more correct when they used his tool. Uh, they didn't complete the tasks any faster when they used his tool. Uh, and they also didn't really prefer using his tool over, over not using this. They found the tool to be unintuitive. So we talked about some of the sort of issues um, around this, but we didn't sort of come back and tie this all together with theory. So that's kind of the leftover bit that I wanted to uh, rehash today. Before we do this, do we, is Frank on the call on, on the uh, Zoom by any chance? So Frank, you know, this might seem familiar to you. I don't know if you're on uh, with us today. I, I can't see the entire gallery. I, I will assume from the silence that you're not. Anyway, so um, let's let's pick this off where we left off. So, like, why um, why build a tool or sort of? I guess um, the thing that I want to talk about is how, um, based on our conversation, I don't know, a week ago when you all talked about your own research, there was a lot of um, uh, interest in sort of uh, using or learning about empirical methods, using empirical methods to evaluate things that uh, aren't so fundamentally empirical in nature, uh, things that, you're, uh, that you've built that are, I don't know, algorithmic or tools or, or uh, things of this nature. And that's why Stu's example was, it was relevant, I think. But what I would like you to think about is sort of what, why is it that you're building a tool, a system, or something new, an algorithm, a formalism, or whatever it is that you're sort of working on, why is it that you're doing this? Is, is that an end uh, in itself? Is, is the tool the end in itself, the goal in itself? Or is it really, is the tool a vehicle to do something else with? So um, I'm gonna argue that uh, there's sort of more fundamental reasons why you might want to build a tool. Um, I'm so sort of gonna use the term tool generically for all these kinds of things, because I think this will behave similarly for, for the purpose of this discussion. Um, and um, well, other than more fundamental reason, other than getting your PhDs, I, I assume. So that's kind of uh, uh, goes without saying. So you're probably building a tool uh, to test the theory. You have a theory about, uh, I don't know, like how um, people collaborate uh, remotely and in distributed settings or over the internet or something, wh whatever it might be. Um, and so you're building a tool in order to study and observe those people uh, doing the things that, that you're really fundamentally interested in uh, and uh, so as, a, as an experimental setup for you to be able to conduct your, your research. So you're building a tool to test the theory. That's sort of one common, uh, common scenario. Maybe alternatively, you're building a tool to develop a theory, right? So the, the ultimate goal of this is kind of a, a theory building and, and learning something 
uh, developing some deeper understanding about something. And the tool is just sort of a vehicle uh, that you're using to, uh, I don't know, to study the people um, uh, using it or something. Uh, and the theory sort of emerges as, as you're uh, exploring this tool. Um, or um, uh, I guess this is kind of very tied to, to the first one. You're building a tool to, to explain some aspect of your, your theory, uh, to illustrate some aspect of your theory. You're building, a, I don't know, a jig to, uh, I don't know, uh, observe apples falling or to measure the velocity of apples falling in order to explain the theory of gravity, things like this. But sort of either way, right, no matter what um, uh, kind of underlying reasons you might have, the point is you're probably building a tool with some sort of uh, deeper goal that has to do with some theory. Um, and so, I guess, how does this relate to Stu? That's where we left off. Like, what is what is Stu's theories, right? So I'm going to argue that um, maybe the main reason why Stu's evaluation, Stu's human study uh, in, in a control setting in a lab uh, didn't turn out the expects that uh, Stu had um, envisioned uh, is because sort of Stu didn't have this theory uh, articulated going into the study. And sort of having had that from the beginning would have maybe informed some of the study design decisions and maybe would have led to more specific um, research questions or hypotheses that then uh, would have uh, sort of shown uh, more uh, intuitive results. So first thing first, uh, there's some sort of background assumptions here. So remember, uh, Stu had built this tool that takes in natural language and produces source code program. So this is sort of meant to um, be like a, uh, I don't know, developer assistant or something in, in your IDE so that you don't have to type code anymore. You can just sort of uh, write using English the, the uh, a description of the intent you're trying to accomplish. And then you get all of this code automatically uh, generated for you so that you don't have to type it in. Okay, so there's some uh, fundamental assumptions here that uh, at least Stu, should think about, if not make uh, explicit uh, in the study itself, in the, in the paper itself. So for example, a uh, fundamental assumption with, with anything like, uh, like Stu's work here is that these programming tasks that, uh, or programming tasks in general can be completed by sort of piecing together uh, code snippets that involve, I don't know, popular libraries or APIs, so sort of they, they can be uh, assembled out of small pieces. That's kind of a, a key, uh, assumption here, because obviously, you know, the uh, AI that takes a natural language and produces programs is not going to be able to produce like giant programs, right? At best, it's going to be able to sort of produce, you know, small uh, code snippets that do something very specific. It's not going to be able to like generate a whole system from, from scratch, just from, you know, a description of your intent. Um, but, you know, it might be able to produce some code snippets that do something specific. And, and the sort of key fundamental assumption behind all of this is that uh, any task really can be, can be accomplished, can be completed uh, by sort of piecing together uh, small things like this, right? So that's, that's sort of something that has to be uh, thought about and just made explicit. Um, another one, for example, is that um, the, the tool itself, right, is, is sort of able to, at least theoretically, is able to produce uh, code snippets like these, right? Uh, and um, I guess that essentially means that there are lots of such examples available somewhere uh, and the tool was trained appropriately and sort of has learned uh, all of these examples and has learned to generalize from them and, and whatnot. But uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the fundamental assumption here is that the nature of the training data that this AI system has been uh, developed with uh, matches the nature of the, the tasks and so on, the, the code snippets that sort of people would actually write um, in, in practice, right? That's sort of a fundamental assumption. Uh, and you know, many others that you could think of, but the point is you have to have to think about these, uh, if not make them explicit, uh, ideally make them explicit, at least think about them, uh, articulate them to yourself, if not in the paper. Okay, so now what is what is Theo's theory? Uh, anybody have any thoughts on this? Like what would be the theory here? Like, how would you even, uh, where would you begin? What are some fragments of Stu's theory?
So here's here's some some uh, one way of thinking about this, but it's obviously not the only way. But one way of thinking about this. So um, first proposition could be that programmers decompose tasks into a sequence of typically small steps whenever they're trying to accomplish anything. So that's kind of that's where the theory starts. Um, and at every step, say arguably, they know conceptually what's, what must be done next. So they have some, some idea of what must happen, but um, A, either they don't know how to create a concrete implementation of that idea, or they sort of know that they need to, I don't know, uh, sort uh, a column of data in some file and then some particular way or whatever, uh, join two things or whatever, look up something in, in, in a table, whatever, you know, if they're data scientists or something. They know sort of uh, conceptually what must be done, but they don't sort of know exactly how to implement that using, I don't know, your favorite programming language. Um, so, or uh, alternatively, they um, know conceptually what must be done, and they also know how to implement this in your favorite programming language. They, they could write this from scratch if they wanted to. They just would rather not have to type it in if they can avoid it. Right, because I don't know, it's maybe faster, it, it's more efficient this way. Okay, so uh, this this is part of the theory. So now think about this. Um, let's say um, you uh, theorize that this NL to code technology could help speed up task completion. Okay, that's kind of what uh, Stu was testing. Well, arguably, this is probably going to only work, or um, if it's going to work anywhere, it's going to work in the B scenario, not the A scenario, OK? Um, because um, you, know, you, sort of, you have to um, be able to recognize when one of these code snippets that uh, NL2Code returns is, is the right one, right? So how do you how do you know, right? So let's say you get a list of I don't know candidates back from the tool. Um, you have to pick one, and you sort of have to know what it does in order to be able to use it, right? It's not enough to know what to know conceptually what must happen if you have no idea how to implement that in your favorite programming language, because you won't be able to recognize if the thing you get back from the tool is actually the thing you, you want it in, or not. You sort of have to be able to recognize it when you see it, but otherwise, well, arguably, this is gonna confuse you more than help you. Okay, so this is sort of one important aspect of Stu's theory that was sort of missing, right, from the description of the study as I, uh, as I mentioned in last, uh, last week, not last week, last class, um, right? So you can see how um, if they just, um, know conceptually what must be done, but they have no idea how to implement that. You can, see, you can see hopefully how they might even get more confused by this and it would become counterproductive, right? So if, if anywhere, if, if, if you would expect to see um, task completion speed ups, it would be in the second scenario where people are able to sort of recognize the right answer when they see it or a right answer when they see it. Does that make sense? Okay, so like, wh why would, so kind of going deeper into, into speed ups here, why would, why would speed ups occur at all, uh, if at all? Like, why would they occur? Well, arguably, they would primarily occur um, because um, if people don't use the tool, um, they have to switch out of their IDE or whatever they're, they're typing this code um, and to go look for uh, how to implement that particular thing, look up the API calls, whatever it might be on Stack Overflow and Google, whatever. And in the process of doing this, there's a high likelihood that they'll get distracted by, I don't know, social media or the news or whatever uh, uh, else might come up. And, um, you know, even though they could sort of, uh, be very efficient and, and focused and just pull out the, uh, look up the code on the internet somewhere and, and copy it or, or something like this, um, they are, um, they, they risk getting distracted and it's better if you don't put them in a situation where this becomes a risk, right? So if everything happens within the IDE and you get all of this stuff 
you know, as you're typing code without any of the context switching, right? On average, that should be to your to your benefit. That's arguably beneficial, right? So it's because of this cost of context switching that you expect to get speed ups. Okay. Uh, because, because people copy code anyway, right? So it's not really uh, because um, of the time it would take people to type the code from scratch, as opposed to uh, typing the English description of intent and sort of just getting the code for free. It's probably not because of this, because people don't really type code from scratch anyway, ever anymore, right? They just sort of look stuff up on the internet and they copy it from Stack Overflow or something, right? At least they do that whenever they can. Uh, they only type in code whenever they can't avoid it. Um, but the, you know, they copy it anyway from somewhere else, right? So um, you know, essentially, I guess what I'm saying is the comparison here is between um, doing this inside your IDE versus doing this with a search engine like Google and sort of browsing through search results. Right, that's essentially the comparison. It's not between doing this in your IDE versus writing it from scratch, probably, right? Because you're probably not writing it from scratch anyway. Okay, so that's sort of an important part of the theory, sort of how people write code in the first place, and so sort of how they look up information when they're confused about something and uh, when they're writing code. Does that make sense? Okay, and you know we can go on and on and on. So the I guess so building on this, I'm not going to continue. I think you get the point. But building on this, um, you can see how um, Stu could have derived maybe some more specific, more targeted hypotheses now that this theory has, has crystallized, uh, now that the theory has been articulated. Um, so here's one example. Four tasks where people have a lot of prior experience, uh, in other words, where they could have written code from scratch if they wanted to, but they sort of knew how to do this. Um, using NL2 code may reduce uh, task completion times or, or should reduce task completion times, right? Because this is sort of, this is kind of the target audience. So people know what they're doing. They could have written the code. Uh, if they wanted to, they just, um, they're, therefore they're able to recognize when they're seeing the right answer or a right answer being uh, offered to them automatically. That's when, if anywhere, that's when you should um, expect to see reductions in and task completion times. Okay, so that's one much more specific hypothesis this time. Um, another one could be that um, the more sort of steps or, or API calls uh, are involved in implementing uh, a solution to a task, the more NL2 code should speed up task completion times. Because these are exactly the kinds of things where you could sort of get stuff for free, the kinds of things that you maybe don't remember, you know, all these API calls and whatnot. Uh, and it would be beneficial to get them sort of offered to you uh, uh, automatically for free without so you have to, having to look them up. And the more of these you have to, to write, to use, right, the more benefit you can expect to get. Okay, so it sort of kind of depends a little bit on how uh, many steps are involved in any particular task. Uh, and, and so on and so forth, right? So we go on and on and on. But the, I think you see the point now that um, the uh, the research question as formulated by Stu originally and my description of the study from, from last uh, uh, class, that is tool A better than tool B, uh, you can see how that's really re insufficiently specific and precise to, to really be answerable and how, um, you know, and in the light of this uh, theory that we just talked about, uh, that research question as formulated doesn't make as, as much sense, right? And how, uh, you know, this, it's the negative results that we, um, we talked about there um, are likely, be, uh, uh, could be explained just because the, um, um, this, this theory was absent, right? And the uh, Stu was maybe measuring the wrong things, but right? we never talked about how um, so Stu uh, took into account uh, how much experience people had or not uh, with these kinds of tasks. We never took, uh, talked about or took into account how many steps are involved in, in uh, writing solutions for these tasks and so on, right? We never talked about any of these uh, important context factors here that kind of uh, impact why uh, Stu may have not observed uh, any results, right? 
be, so it's really fundamental is because of the way the study was designed and arguably because this theory was missing. So hopefully uh, I, I've convinced you of this. Let's see, any, any thoughts? So the take home message to wrap this up is you have to articulate the theory underlying your work, even if your work is, is of this sort of tool building, system building, formalism building, whatever it might be, uh, nature. Um, like if whenever you're planning some kind of um, evaluation involving humans um, of, of these things that you're developing and building, you have to articulate the theory underlying your work. Uh, and that will also guide the, the way you design this evaluation uh, and, and guide your research questions, hypotheses, everything else that you do, but you sort of have to do this. Um, and I mean, ideally you do this in a paper too. You do this as you're, uh, as you're writing a paper and writing the evaluation section and whatnot. But even if you don't, you sort of at least do it in your head or do it in, you know, in your notes, but you have to do this. You see how Stu's uh, study could have been designed and may have turned out very, very differently if Stu had put more thought into the theory underlying his work. Um, you have to be precise about your research questions. We, we talked at length about formulating research questions. Uh, I won't go back to that, but you can refer back to that lecture for, for details. Um, it also helps to be deliberate, if not explicit. Ideally, you're also explicit, but at least deliberate about your philosophical stance here, about what you're willing to accept as an answer to these research questions. Um, and you can use the theory that you have articulated uh, if you're doing something like this, or you know, if you're borrowing it from somewhere else, that's fine too. But you use the theory to guide your study design. So the, the one bit summary is, if you're, if you're doing research that involves a lot of tool building and you're looking to evaluate those tools, Test the theory, not the tool. Evaluate the theory, not the tool you're building explicitly. Okay, that's the the one bit here. And um, just to wrap up the whole uh, theory section, um, think of theories uh, or theory in uh, empirical research as this lens through which uh, everything, the world, is observed uh, and uh, interpreted. And this is actually unavoidable. Uh, I'm gonna argue that even if you're not doing this explicitly, you're not articulating or acknowledging these theories, uh, you're using them implicitly just because the real world and all of these phenomena that we're studying are way too complex to uh, be, be capturable uh, without some kind of filtering. And that's, kind of, that's what the theory gives you, this ability to filter out, um, to abstract, to filter out sort of uh, irrelevant things or focus on the important things. Um, okay, yeah, if you're doing quantitative research that involves quantitative methods, typically theory is so how you decide which variables to uh, consider, which variables to ignore, which things to measure. Um, and that's sort of very important, right? So which are the things that may be confounding factors that could sort of explain some relationship you're, you're observing beyond the, the thing you hypothesize is the, is the cause, for example, right? You sort of have to measure and isolate those and, and separate the effects of, of, of those variables from the ones you care about, right? And so theory can help guide this. If you're doing, if you're using qualitative methods, then you can use theory to, to help focus your data analysis, your interpretation, right? Which things from your qualitative data do you, do you focus on? Do you try to interpret? Do you, do you try to, uh, to, to code, to, to abstract away from, to make up stories from, to build theory from, um, versus which things to ignore? So you sort of need this uh, theory to focus kind of what you're, what you're seeing in, in the data you're, um, you're analyzing qualitatively. Um, okay, more generally, um, without theory, um, we have no way of making sense of the accumulation of empirical results in science in general, including in, in our type of science. Um, because, and I've, I've argued this at length, at length in the past, um, 
any individual paper or study um, it is unlikely to ever offer any uh, highly conclusive results. Uh, it might offer strong evidence for something, but it sort of rarely can uh, be the, uh, the one-stop shop for, for anything. And it's through this accumulation of results and, and, and knowledge and knowledge bits uh, over time in different settings by different uh, researchers and so on and so forth that knowledge develops, right? And so uh, theory is the way to kind of put all of this together, to, to bring all of this stuff together and make sense of all of these results. Um, and, and that's through this process of analytical generalization. Uh, because, because you can then, if, if you're not testing a particular, uh, I don't know, tool, but rather a particular uh, theory, right, then you can make, uh, what's the, the uh, a great uh, a characteristic of theories is that they have predictive power. If you're uh, finding evidence supporting some theory in some context, you can make predictions about, that about how that phenomenon might also occur in other settings, in other contexts, in other populations, whatever, as per, as per the theory, right? So this is a more powerful um, technique to generalize results beyond any specific study, right? Because you're sort of able to project, to make predictions based on this theory, uh, even for things that you've never seen, okay? So for example, uh, the, the other way to generalize results from some empirical study is through, uh, I don't know, statistical generalization, right? So like sampling theory would tell you that um, if you study some sample of, uh, I don't know, some number of people, and for example, you study their voting preferences or whatever, their uh, things like this, that's how pollsters uh, work. Um, you are able to make predictions about how the entire country is gonna vote, for example, uh, by sort of studying how this small sample of people is going to vote with some confidence, with some statistical confidence and, and some margin of error. You can make projections based on that. Um, but for example, if I um, um, change the context entirely, right, the, my ability to generalize statistically from, from a sample is, is gone, whereas my ability to generalize analytically using some kind of underlying theory that explains the phenomenon uh, at a more fundamental level, right, that remains. So I can make projections stretching farther than I could through just sort of statistical sampling uh, uh, techniques. So it's much more powerful to do it this way. Okay, so hopefully this is um, another argument um, to convince you that theories are useful. And we talked about how all the methods are flawed. You can see, see uh, here's some examples uh, and theory can help reduce these weaknesses because um, you so start thinking about, for example, hypotheses not in isolation as one-offs, but sort of as instances uh, of some sort of clearly stated theory and, and evidence building towards this clearly stated theory, rather than kind of being specific and, and restricted to some particular context that your, uh, your, your study is restricted to. Okay, so um, that's it, that's kind of the, uh, the rant about theory is that theory is really useful. It's a great strategy to uh, sort of overcome the weaknesses of individual studies. And it's also a great strategy to uh, think about or design or uh, execute any individual studies. So this, this is the bit about theory and I'm gonna take a quick break and sort of, uh, collect your thoughts about this before moving on to the main topic for today. Thoughts or questions or rotten tomatoes. You can throw as many as you like. I'm, you know, on, on the internet somewhere. I'm, they're not going to hit me. I'm immune from your rotten tomatoes. Okay. Um, we can come back to this if you if um, you think of questions later. So let me move on to uh, what I was planning as the main topic for today, um, and that is to look at uh, literature reviews um, in a in a little bit more depth. This is maybe one of the most um, underrated parts of of any research study or research paper is sort of the literature review. It's often one of the parts that uh, 
gets written last after you've written the entire paper as one of these filler things that, I don't know, for whatever reason, reviewers expect and, and uh, complain. And I don't know, you've been taught that are uh, a must have section of your paper. Uh, you're not sure why, but you sort of, you know, people expect it to be there. You sort of expect it to be there. Uh, and you kind of begrudgingly write this, you know, the day before the deadline, just to, uh, to you know, mar <laughs> to, to mark that you, you've done this. Okay. And I, I'm gonna try to convince you that actually, um, these are a lot more important uh, than, than you think and a lot more useful than you think. Uh, also a lot harder to get right than, than maybe you think. But let's talk about lit reviews. Okay? So the um, a key question uh, when you're choosing a research topic, any research topic is, uh, so you should ask yourself this question. Um, can this be studied versus should this be studied? Like, I, you know, I, I want this to be at the, at the top of your mind whenever you're kind of contemplating choosing a new uh, thing to work on. Can it be studied versus should it be studied? Right? And um, arguably, uh, having something that can be studied is not reason enough for you to spend your uh, limited time and, and energy on. Right? So uh, I'm going to try to convince you that something ought to also ought to be studied, not just uh, be feasible to study something. Okay. So this is where lit reviews come in because they sort of help answer this, these kind of questions. Like what does studying this particular topic add to the body of knowledge, if anything, right? So are, are we sort of uh, humankind collectively learning anything new if you're going to work on this new research topic, like what, what does this study add or this work that you're going to do add to the body of knowledge more generally? Um, and um, so that's sort of, you know, does it fill a knowledge gap? Are we learning something new? Right? You need to have this. If we're not learning anything new, there's, you know, there's not really any point in, in, uh, in doing this. But really, um, more importantly, who else beside you would care about the results as the other, the other bit here. Okay, so uh, it's not enough if you're, you're sort of personally uh, interested in exploring something or excited about something, or uh, I don't know, enjoy working on something, doing something. Probably not enough if you're the only person or maybe just you and your advisor. Um, if you're the only people in the world that care about those results, it's probably not gonna be enough. Uh, you probably wanna work on something where other people beside you also care uh, that those results happen, materialize. So um, there's multiple purposes that the lit review serves, including this. But um, th so the one that you're maybe most thinking of when you're thinking of lit reviews or like the related work section in a paper, that's sort of another name by which lit reviews are, are, are known in uh, computer science research papers. Um, you probably think of lit reviews as a report on what is known about a particular topic. Uh, and that's certainly true. Like you, you, you need to have this and that's important. All right. So you, uh, lit reviews serve this purpose. They um, give you a way to share with the, the reader results from studies related to the one you, you, you're reporting on, you're writing about. Um, if you're, I don't know, uh, maybe more, um, uh, I don't know, ML or similar areas, uh, um, review of the literature also gives you a way to you know, benchmark and compare results and uh, things like that. So if you have some, um, some prior works and benchmarks to compare your new work against. So certainly that's all, that's all valuable and I'm not discounting this by any means. But really, um, lit reviews serve a different purpose, much more important purpose. Um, and that is to identify and articulate what remains unknown. Okay, so it's not just to report on what is known, but it's arguably primarily, I, I'm going to argue this, is to uh, identify what remains unknown. Okay? Um, so then when you think about your own study, okay, how does that, like, what are the knowledge gaps from this literature, from this body of knowledge, what are the gaps in that knowledge that your current study helps fill, right? So how does, 
how concretely, specifically, how does your study fill uh, knowledge gaps and, and what are those knowledge gaps? Um, and that actually um, is very useful um, if you do this at the beginning of, uh, of a research project rather than at the end, which sort of happens in practice when people are writing papers, uh, because it gives you a direction for your research questions, for your hypotheses, for your study design, for what have you. But so doing this lit review at the beginning of a project is more useful than, than doing this at the end, just uh, because you sort of have to put this in a paper. Um, it also provides a framework to establish the importance of your study, right? So uh, it um, shows that maybe lots of other people care about a particular topic and, and they've worked on, on it for a long time and it's, it's important and so on. And that, that allows you uh, to, to, to motivate why your study should uh, happen and why anyone but you should care about the results of your study. Um, okay, so there's so different flavors of, of lit reviews. Um, the, the common one, I guess, the most common one maybe is where you're kind of integrating, synthesizing, summarizing what others have done and said about a particular topic. Um, I guess uh, also in the process of doing that, you're, you're often sort of criticizing, reflecting on, on prior work, critis critically on, on prior work, identifying knowledge gaps. Um, Sometimes you see people doing lit reviews um, more for the purpose of, of doing lit reviews, kind of as a, as a goal in itself. And those tend to have slightly uh, different forms. They maybe make bridges between topics and disciplines and whatnot. They uh, identify the central issues remaining in the field after, I don't know, 40 years of research, um, especially the more systematic lit reviews. I'm not gonna talk about those in particular. So referring specifically to many lit reviews as you would do uh, uh, when you're writing a technical research paper on, on some any other particular topic, not as a lit reviews as a goal by themselves. Um, yeah, another side here, um, lit reviews are also useful because they force you to articulate your uh, contributions of your current study. So is it that you're addressing a new topic? Is it that you're using a new data collection method? Is it that you're extending the discussion of some uh, phenomenon or results? Is it that you're refining or refuting or extending a theory? Is it that you're replicating something that's known somewhere else in, in a new context and so on, right? So, but unless you do this at the beginning of a research project, unless you sort of have this map of the body of knowledge on the problem you're uh, contemplating working on, unless you do that at the beginning, uh, it's sort of it's going to be hard to um, um, be deliberate about what the contributions of your particular study might be. Okay, so it's it's useful to do this early. Okay, so now let's move on to um, to this. I've asked you to to read these uh, couple of papers, or rather, read the beginning parts, the uh, roughly introductions to to these two papers, and to think about a few questions. I've asked you to think about um, how much prior work was there about these topics? Um, how did people um, uh, organize this literature when, when they talked about it? Like, how did they refer to prior work? How did they structure this? How did they organize this? What kinds of research questions were they asking? Um, what was the knowledge gap? What is it that uh, these studies were, um, what new knowledge were these studies contributing? Uh, and so I guess who cares would be the, the other question I, uh, I would add to this. So I'm going to break you up into, uh, into groups. If you hadn't had a chance to, um, to uh, read these before class, take a look quickly. Uh, and if you hopefully you've had a chance to, to read these, I want you to discuss um, in, uh, in groups answers to these couple of questions. Sorry, these, these few questions for these couple of papers. Uh, I don't know, five, 10 minutes. Uh, and then we'll reconvene and we're going to talk about kind of um, uh, this in more detail. I want to dissect these uh, these lit reviews together with you uh, in more detail once you've had a chance to talk about them. All right, welcome back. So let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, let's see let's see what you thought. So how about we start with let's start with the the Marcus uh, paper. Um, so. Somebody volunteer to um, kind of summarize answers to the question I, questions I had before. So 
Um, so how much prior work was there known? Uh, what were the research questions? How did they organize the discussion of this prior work? Um, what was the knowledge gap and why was it important? So, Any, somebody we haven't usually, or we haven't heard from in a while would be great to, to summarize the discussion you had in your group. Um, I, can, I can try to do that. So this is the open source uh, software paper, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so for this one, um, the, uh, their research question, they have a bunch of research questions, um, but um, I feel like it, in general, what they're trying to do is to, um, uh, to, to look into the process of how, the, um, how people develop uh, these two specific open source software and what's the, um, what's the, also what's the community like and where they are and how the different roles are um, distributed in this community how they um how they do different things um in the process of developing uh, these two open source um open source projects um so that i guess that's the research question um in terms of the literature um it's kind of we found it kind of hard to to identify because they don't have a standalone literature review session section um i it looks like most of the um I mean, it looks like they include the literature review basically in their int introduction. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they, um, um, I, I think they, yeah, basically they, um, uh, in the introduction, they introduce a, a different um, various sort of um, concepts in open source software development. And also um, the, um, uh, is the, uh, some of the mechanisms or some of the basically the prior work in terms of in, in this area uh, in terms of open source development um, but I feel like they're um, it's it's more it's more just generally organized in terms of, uh, as as a as an introduction rather than as a um, literature review section it's, it's more organized in terms of their um, process of going into this topic and um, um, and and what they what they are looking for and what they're trying to do so um i guess that um that ties to what they are trying to um address so like the knowledge gap um and also what the importance is basically they look at these two open source projects which are very successful and what they're trying to find out is what's the process behind it and how can we extend the process to um, benefit other open source software, basically, um, how can we use the um, same process to um, to find out what um, what makes open source so uh, software success and how do we develop other generally open source so uh, software successfully? Yeah, yeah th thanks, Sam. Those are those are a great discussion uh, summary. Um, what's the? Let me sort of. Um, dive deeper a little bit into something what's the actual knowledge gap though like what is the what is it that we don't know uh, we didn't know prior to the study um can somebody sort of uh somebody else that has discussed this like what is it that was the, what was the actual gap in knowledge that this study tries to fill uh one of the other groups i think the major one was that we don't know how OS's team produce high quality software products. And more specifically, so they have some observations find that OSS teams are very different from traditional software engineering teams, like uh, that most of the developers are volunteered to do so instead of being paid. Uh, and also people decide what task they want to do instead of being assigned a specific task. So they have a series of observations about uh, how OSS is different, but they don't know why that they can still achieve success, even though that is so different from the traditional software engineering, which is known that they can traditional software engineering can be success can be successful, but they don't know why OS team can be successful as well with mm -hmm. so much difference. 
Yeah, thank you. Bobo. I, uh, I was going to sort of push back on this uh, based on the beginning of your uh, your comment, but you sort of addressed this. So, I mean, we've been studying software engineers, uh, sorry, software engineering for many decades, e even by the time this paper was published, right? So we knew lots about how people develop software in commercial settings, right? So like, why should we care about open source software? Like, what's the actual knowledge gap? It's just another place where people develop software. Uh, right, so we we know very well how people develop software um, elsewhere, and this is just another place where people develop software. So, like, it's not obvious that there's a gap there. You see what I mean? But uh, you address this, and, and um, they did a very good job at sort of motivating how um, everything is different in open source. Right, nothing makes sense. Right, so none of the things that are uh, so sort of fundamental assumptions, remember this, uh, you got to have a theory, right? So fundamental assumptions about how people develop software from all the places where um, software development had been studied before, none of those hold anymore in this new context, right? So that's the gap. The gap is, you know, even though we know a lot about how people develop software, in this particular context, so many of our fundamental assumptions are violated and we, we have no, yet, yet, they still seem to succeed, these open source projects. Okay? So even though our fundamental assumptions, our theory was challenged um, by, in this new domain, in this new context, people still seem to succeed uh, developing software here, right? So like, that doesn't make any sense. Like what happens? Why, how are they able to do this? Okay, so, see how it's sort of important to, to kind of really articulate the gap there. It's, it's not that um, it's a new context per se that is the gap, but it's that the context is just so fundamentally different that it challenges everything we know about software development or, or so much of what we know. Okay? And um, well, why is this important? Like who cares? I mean, I think the entire software engineering community would, would care just because we would like to know if there even is a difference. We don't know. But if there is a difference that could open up entire, you know, new, um, entire new like fields of research even, how do we get people to collaborate on different sides of the globe? We don't even know if this is a real problem yet. Um, and, and either way it goes, if it's the same or if it's different, this is valuable knowledge. Hmm. Well, I guess, I guess another way of saying the same is um, if we can better understand why these people that are working so differently from anything we've uh, ever thought of before, yet they seem to succeed, if we sort of understand how it is that they are able to do so, right, maybe we could change all of the other ways we um, we've been developing software this entire time, right? To kind of learn from this new way of developing software, um, if, if that's beneficial, right? Maybe we don't all need to be co-located, right? Maybe we could just be just as uh, productive working from home. Maybe I can teach this class from my uh, nursery, <laughs> from my guest bedroom. Um, I, I don't need to be on campus, right? Um, so it's sort of important to, to know this. Um, okay, so um, I um, we, we've covered all of this. I took out some sort of excerpts from um, from the paper. Um, we don't have to to go over these in detail, but you can find uh, you can find these as notes. So sort of the the key parts of the argument that I that I thought the authors were making, kind of a, a summary of the the parts you've read. Um, and key to this is, uh, and we talked about this, is that they they had um, articulated both. Uh, this gap in knowledge, like what is it that we didn't know, right? So what's the unknown? Remember how the lit review, um, the, the main point I was arguing of a lit review is to articulate what remains unknown. They've done a very good job of doing this. They've articulated why um, all our assumptions or so many of our assumptions are, are challenged in this new context. And we just don't know any of these things. So that's, that's the gap. And they've also had uh, this thing called a hook. They sort of told you why it's important that you know, anybody addresses that knowledge gap. It's not just enough to have a knowledge gap to uh, be worth um, 
doing research on, I, I was arguing this in the beginning, it's a, you sort of also have to have somebody care about your, your results. It's just um, somebody needs to care that you've done this. And the, the gap is, um, let's see, I have some notes here. Um, the gap is that, um, Okay, this is a quote from the paper. If all it says really does pose a major challenge to the economics and the methods of commercial development, it's vital to understand it and evaluate. Okay, so the, the hook here is if we understand um, sort of how open source is, why these people developing open source are successful, that changes everything about how um, we do everything else, right? Because, because the model uh, in which they work and collaborate and whatnot is just so fundamentally radically different. It's that challenges everything else where, where people to work together to do things. And so th this was, I thought this was very, very well written. And actually, let me step back for a second. Um, so look, so this, I've, I've highlighted here the parts of the paper that I've asked you to read, just the, the beginning of the paper. It's a little over two pages in this very generous format with like uh, big margins and whatnot. So look how concisely they were able to sort of build this, uh, I thought, excellent argument for uh, to what the problem is, what the gap in the knowledge is, and why anybody should care if this gap is filled okay? in very little uh, text. Uh, and they did this without sort of having a, a explicit section on um, on the lit review. They also integrated this as part of um, as part of their introduction, as Sam was saying in the beginning. So I guess the, the take home message from this is, you know, you needn't be purists about form um, as long as as long as you have the content. Right. So the form is less um, less important than the actual uh, content. Okay, let's talk about the second one for a little bit. What What's up with the second paper? Uh, somebody we haven't heard from already, please. The shortened tweet paper. But these are essentially the, the parts I've asked you to read uh, that you see highlighted here, just for, for reference. Um, same question, like what, what's a summary of the, the research goal or the main research question? Um, and how did they sort of talk about prior work and, and things like that? What's the knowledge gap? Just the summary of the discussion you've had in your in your group would be great. You don't need to all go at once. Anybody brave volunteer? No? Okay, then we don't, we don't discuss the second paper, I guess. Here are some things I took out though, um, just for, uh, for reference. So here, the, um, they start with kind of an overview. This, this was a much more complicated argument. You, I think you'll agree, right? So there was a lot more, there were lots, a lot more steps to the argument they were making, right? It wasn't as readable, I thought. Uh, as the other paper. I don't know if you, you would agree with this. That was my, my impression. Okay. Uh, and I, uh, I think this is because, so unlike the previous paper, the Marcus paper, um, the, here there was a lot more prior work. Okay, so arguably, and the, the Moscow's paper before, um, we knew very little about that the problem at the time that the paper was written. Um, here, there was a lot of work already. Like this was a, sort of, we were much farther uh, along uh, with our collective knowledge of, of this phenomenon when this paper happened. So we, we sort of knew a lot more. So they also had to like spend a lot more effort 
uh, I don't know, summarizing and characterizing all this prior work and sort of positioning their study in this context. Okay, so I think you'll see the contrast um, between the two papers and sort of how much prior knowledge there was of, of the phenomenon. Um, but I guess here they start building this argument, right? So one step at a time. So information streams are increasingly popular, like the kinds of things you see on, on social media. Um, but when you have um, all of this abundance of information, you also get scarcity of attention. Right? You can't just sort of pay attention to all of this. It's, it's overwhelming. It's too much information to process. Um, so uh, you need to sort of filter the stream down somehow. It's kind of how they start uh, building the argument. Um, and they're saying one approach that people have tried to do this is to um, recommend interesting content to users uh, to direct their attention to that content that is, uh, is recommended, as opposed to having them sort of look at the entire thing, which is which is too much to process. Okay. Um, okay. Next. So um, recommenders are this solution to attention scarcity, uh, and they've been around for forever. They've been studied for years. Right? Lots of recommenders. Okay. So we know a lot about uh, about recommenders. Uh, they sort of dive even deeper here. There's like one specific kind of recommender uh, that is maybe uh, most well known, and that's this collaborative filtering kind. Um, you're inferring um, similarity between um, preferences of, of different users based on uh, the overlap of rated items across users. This is sort of how all of these things work, like Netflix and so on, right? You get recommendations for. Uh, movies you might like based on what other people uh, have liked that have watched some of the same movies as, as you before, right? That's kind of the, how all of these things work. Um, okay, so this is kind of a popular approach to recommenders. We still haven't gotten, still a lot of buildup. We still haven't gotten to what it is they've done uh, or what the knowledge gap is. Um, these collaborative filtering recommenders have a problem though. Um, they suffer from, um, Little, little user rating overlap early on, the, uh, on the cold start problem, right? If, if you haven't watched any films yet on Netflix, we don't know who to match you against and, and sort of compare your preferences to those people's preferences so that we can recommend you other uh, movies to watch. Um, so we, sort of, we, we can't use that information. We have to use uh, some other information, right? The common solution is to use other sources of information to do this uh, filtering. This recommendation. Um, and there's a ton of research on um, recommenders that use the textual content of items, is what they're saying. Okay, so still building up a lot of kind of uh, summarizing of uh, where we are in our state of knowledge. Um, and uh, furthermore, recommendations can be generated from explicit social information and social processes as well. So there's uh, other sources of external information that you could bring in to, to compute these recommendations. Okay. So here's where it gets interesting. This is kind of where they start articulating the gap. So far, it's just been a, an overview of the problem, really. The problem is the cold start problem with recommender systems. Okay. That's the problem. But they haven't really articulated a knowledge gap. So this is where they sort of start getting into this. Um, so now they're saying Twitter um, has um, both textual and social information available. Okay. So therefore, um, you know, one might uh, wonder whether um, these, these prior work uh, approaches that either use textual information or social information to, to mitigate the cold star problem, whether these might be applicable for a Twitter recommender. Okay. So that's the knowledge gap. The knowledge gap is, you know, can we, um, can we so combine these things that are present in our context uh, that have been so studied separately, um, can we combine them and apply them in this particular uh, setting? Uh, they, they've not been implemented and evaluated on Twitter or information streams in general. This is important Okay, so they're saying or information streams in general, like we shouldn't really care about Twitter as an instance, uh, so as a, um, a singleton, as a one-off thing. We should care about Twitter as an instance of something bigger, right? Test the theory, not the tool. It's not about Twitter per se, but it's about information streams more, more generally. Okay, so that's the gap. So now um, 
It's unclear whether these techniques uh, function well, given the differences between their original domains and Twitter, or if some techniques need to be changed and, and uh, adapted to fit the needs of Twitter users and how we would go about doing this. That's the gap. We just don't know if these things are applicable in the new context and, and how we might need to change them. Okay, so um, let's see what else. Right, so our work not only depicts the design space of a Twitter recommender, but also better informed designers of recommenders for other information streams more generally. Okay, so that's the hook. Okay, so if we can figure this out for Twitter, because Twitter is this instance of some sort of uh, more general theory, right, of information streams in general, chances are if we could solve this for Twitter, we could solve this for any other thing that has information stream, right? So that's the hope. It's really important, right? It's not just it's not just Twitter, which maybe by itself is important too, but it's actually even more than that because we have all these other things that are like Twitter in some fundamental way that we could apply similar solutions to. Okay, so you see this? Do you see why it's important? So I guess from these two things that we've looked at, you can see sort of three components to a really good lit review. One, you have to identify the problem that, um, that you're so talking about, that your research uh, is trying to solve, right? You have to articulate the problem. Two, you have to establish uh, that there is a gap in our current knowledge or thinking about the problem and what that gap is. You have to articulate the gap. What is it? So it's, there is a gap and here's what the gap is. Here's what we don't know yet. Okay. And number three, you have to articulate a hook um, that convinces readers uh, that this gap is uh, worth filling. It's not just enough that there's a gap that we don't know something about uh, something, but you also have to articulate why it's important. What are the implications of filling that gap? Who should care if we fill that gap? Okay, so this is the, the part that is um, almost always missing, right? Papers are not always uh, written well, uh, and you rarely, you rarely see this sort of very clearly articulated. Um, and what are the implications of filling that gap? Um, and um, so, the, okay, so these three things combined, this is referred to as the problem gap hook heuristic for, for writing lit reviews. I've um, um, pasted some references uh, where you could read in more detail about this. Uh, but so this, you know, if you remember something uh, from this lit review discussion, you remember this one thing that whenever you're doing lit reviews, articulate these three components, make them explicit in your lit reviews, right? What is the problem? What's the gap in our knowledge of the problem? And what's the hook? Who cares? Who care? What are the implications of filling that gap? Who cares about your results, right? So these things should always be together um, when, you're, when you're writing a lit review. Uh, and I guess we've seen from the examples we looked at that the form, the format is less important. It doesn't matter really if it's in a dedicated section or not, right? But it, what matters is that you actually are uh, explicit about these things. Um, okay, so uh, we're, I guess I was optimistic about uh, ending super uh, ahead of schedule, but we are at least hopefully ending on time. Uh, what I want to uh, ask you is to, um, um, write a blog post as a small critique blog post, um, kind of reflecting uh, in a similar way that we have, we've done together as a group uh, in class today on um, the best practices that we've seen discussed in class so far um, for a research paper published recently in some top venue in your particular area, some, some uh, I don't know, conference or journal where you, uh, in your area that you're uh, you follow. Um, so to browse through recently published papers there, uh, and it has to be a paper that has some empirical component, otherwise it, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, hopefully not the paper that you know I've published, it doesn't have to be about me, because uh, hopefully you find papers by uh, other people. Um, and 
So reflect on these things, reflect on their research questions, right? How well formulated uh, and specific are they? Um, reflect on the lit review, right? No matter where they put it, if it's a dedicated section or if it's an introduction, um, like, is there a problem clearly articulated? Is the gap in knowledge clearly articulated? Is there a hook? What's the hook, right? So how do they do this? Um, is, is there an underlying theory that's even better, right? Do they, do the authors uh, mention this? Uh, and just write a blog post with your reflections, right? your, your thoughts, uh, your critique of this paper that you find. Um, as a side effect, I'm curious how many papers you'll have to browse through before you find a good example. Uh, you, hopefully you'll tell me that um, next week. I'm curious how easy it is to find a good example when you just uh, go browsing for one. Because um, uh, I, I suspect that um, not all papers are written equally well. But anyway, so I'll leave you with this. Um, and we are uh, about to end on time. So I'm happy to take some, some questions you might have uh, at the end now. So um, how exactly do we submit the blog post? Is that through Canvas or, yeah, how? Yeah, so um, thank you. I forgot to mention. Uh, I'm going to open up a Canvas uh, submission. Um, I, oops, excuse me. Ideally, um, you could write a markdown file uh, and uh, submit it as that. I'd like to publish them on the, on the class website um, afterwards. So if you could do it as a markdown file, it'd be a lot easier for me to just take that and, and publish it. Um, if you wanna send a, I don't know, a pull request directly to the class website on GitHub, that's fine too. Um, if you're familiar with that process and you'd rather do that, that's fine. But I'll open up a Canvas submission so you could do that through Canvas if you, if you prefer. Um, if you, you don't have to do a markdown file, you could just do like, a, I don't know, a PDF document or whatever. Um, but if you can directly do a markdown file, it's gonna be easier for me to um, uh, publish these. I'd like to, with your permission, of course, I'd like to post them on the class website as sort of reflections of, of uh, readings we have done in class. Does that make sense, Hannah? Yeah, thank you. Oh, if no more questions, I will see you on Tuesday. Hope you have a good weekend and happy Lunar New Year to those of you celebrating. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks. See you next time.